What's up everybody, Daniel Dan Sports News here bringing you the 25th episode of the Dan Sports News and Friends podcast. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook at Dan Sports News and Instagram at I am Dan Sports News to catch all my latest articles and interviews in sports. Today's episode is with Jim Laritz who won two World Series titles with the New York Yankees. Check it out. How old were you when you first started playing baseball? Eight years old. Was baseball the first sport that you played growing up? No. Uh, bowling was first, basketball was second, and baseball was third. When did you realize you had the skill to play at the next level? After my junior year of high school, I gave. I decided to, instead of pursuing basketball for college, I decided to pursue baseball uh, as, as a profession. Right. And I know you played community college baseball first. What was it like playing there before playing Division I baseball at Kentucky? Yeah, I went to a, a junior college because I was supposed to be drafted out of high school but broke my leg four days before the draft and was hoping that by going to a junior college I would give myself an opportunity to be drafted after my freshman and sophomore year and unfortunately uh, was, was, didn't get drafted during that time. And then I ended up going to the University of Kentucky and uh, played my junior year there, didn't get signed, didn't get drafted then. And then went out to play in a summer league for the Collegiate League in Kansas called the Jayhawk League. And they saw me playing out there, and they signed me as a free agent out there. And what's the biggest difference between the college game and the MLB? Well, I mean, the, the first couple levels of minor league ball are pretty much similar to college. It's all the best college players basically playing against each other. Um, and that's a pretty, 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 uh, a pretty good level. Single A is, is a good level to start on. When you get to double A, that's when it really becomes challenging because now you've, you're playing against guys who have already um, been good enough to move up to that next level uh, after college. Now, when you made it to the New York Yankees, how did that moment feel that you were finally a professional baseball player in the big leagues? Well, yeah, my first time getting called up, I actually was, I got called up to Baltimore. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't quite the same as putting on the pinstripes the first time three days later. Um, but it was pretty special, you know, you know getting an opportunity my very first day in Baltimore to come up and pinch it in the ninth inning and the first time, my first major league at bat got a base hit, drove in the tying run, and uh, that was a pretty special moment. Now tell me about your 1995 walk-off home run in the 15th inning um, with the Yankees. What's going through your mind leading up to that home run? And then how did you feel after you hit the home run? Well, just before I was going out to the on-deck circle, uh, it was the bottom of the 15th inning, Buck Showalter grabbed me and said, this is your last bat, make it count, because I had caught all 15 innings. Um, and I hit the walk-off home run, and, you know, of course, to, you know, to me, even though I've hit some, some other big home runs, to me, as far as the moment goes, that's still my, still my most special moment just because it was a walk-off in Yankee Stadium, uh, you know, in a playoff game. And it was kind of like the beginning of my postseason uh, home run streak that I went on over the next couple of years. Um, so that, that, was, that was a pretty special game. And unfortunately, we didn't win that series. So the home run just kind of became a footnote. Right. I'm sure it was much more meaningful the next season in 1996 um, when you hit the two-run shot to win 8-6 after being down 6 nothing 
in the against the Braves in the World Series. Um, tell me about that home run. How did that feel? Well, you know, the interesting thing when I when I speak to kids about what it's all about as far as winning goes, and winning is the most important thing. It's not the individual goals. You know, I hit the walk off against the Mariners to win that game, uh, and we didn't win the series, so it really didn't mean that much. The home run I hit against the Braves only tied the game up, but we went on to win, and we went on to win the World Series. That's why that home run is looked at as the home run that started the dynasty for the Yankees, because that was kind of the turning point uh, of the World Series. Um, but again, you, when you look back on it, you realize that had we not won the World Series, again, that home run just would have been a great, another great home run. How does it feel to win the World Series um, when it's done, all the championship, and to finally get the championship ring? What does it mean to you to win the World Series? Well, it was pretty special, especially the way we won it by losing the first two games in the World Series and really everybody counting us out. And then we were able to come back like we did. Um, I still tell people to this day, you know, I've done two parades in New York, uh, one in 96 and one in 99. And the 99, even though we won again, it was no comparison to what the 96 parade was like in New York. Right. And before the second parade, you were a part of the Padres that went to the World Series and lost against your former team, the Yankees. Um, what's it like being on the opposite side of winning the World Series? Well, you're, initially when you lose, you don't. nobody likes to lose. But then you look over there and you realize these are all your friends that you've been playing with all the years before. Um you know, at least if you were going to lose, you lost to somebody that you that you liked. Uh, but it was tough, you know, because we had a really we had a great run that year in San Diego, um, also. But uh, you know, the ultimate goal for us to win the World Series in San Diego, we didn't do that. But probably even more important is that '98 run that we went on with the Padres really turned the tide of the fans and the people, in the community of San Diego to vote yes on building a new stadium for the Padres. So that night, it was really great to be part of that 98 Padre team, that because of that team and how well we did, that we were able to get approval for the new Petco Park that stands there today. Right. And then in 1999, you yourself go back to another World Series, once again with the Yankees, and win against the Braves again. And you hit the last home run of the 90s. Um, how does it feel to know that you're in the history books for hitting the last home run, not only of the 90s, but the millennium? Yeah, you know, it was pretty special because when I first got traded back to the Yankees after coming off a broken hand with the Padres, um, I couldn't really hit the ball out even in batting practice. My, my hand just was not 100%. And... Um, I told Derek Jeter and Chuck Knobloch because they were giving me a hard time during batting practice one day. And I said, listen, I'll hit a home run when it counts. Don't worry. And sure enough, when I hit that home run, and I, you know, as a pinch hit, you know, I pinch hit for Daryl Strawberry. As a pinch hit, when I came around the bases and when I came into the dugout, if you watch the replay, you can see both Jeter and Knobloch going, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Uh, because that was, that was the only home run I hit when I returned back to the Yankees and uh, turned out to be a pretty big one. How much pressure do you feel as a pinch hitter um, coming to bat and the team really needs you to come through? How much pressure is there on a hitter as a pinch hitter in that position? Well, I think one of the things people always ask me, why were you able to come through in all of these big moments? Not just one time, but all of these big moments. And, you know, what was your mindset? I said, well, at a very young age, when I was 14 years old, I used to go to spring training with my best friend, Tommy Brenneman, who was an announcer, and his dad was the, the Reds announcer. And we used to hang out with the team at the team hotel, and I got to meet Pete Rose, who was my idol. And Pete Rose, I always asked him one time, I said, you know, what makes you such a great hitter, you know, all the time? And he said, that the way he approached hitting, and, and for, for, you know, for, the way he approached it was 
The first at bat in spring training is just as important as my last at bat of the season, whether it's the season, the playoffs, or the World Series. And he said, I never want to give up an at bat. So therefore, I treat everyone the same way. So when that time does come, when there's more pressure, when most people feel more pressure, my mindset was, this is no different than my first at bat of the year. And just approach it the same way. And I think that kind of mindset uh, really helped me uh, when I was in, you know, when those times came up because, again, I never got caught up in the moment. To me, it was just another at bat, and I was, I was, I wanted to do well every at bat that I ever got. Right. Now, Derek Jeter was just inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame a few weeks ago. And you were there when he was first starting out in baseball on the Yankees. Um, what do you think of Derek Jeter making the Hall of Fame? Um, he was one vote shy of unanimous vote. What do you think of that? And do you have any memorable moments that stand out to you um, on your time playing with Derek? Well, yeah, I mean, Derek was, you know, Derek was I'd say, one of a kind, but one of a few uh, that was able to play in New York for 20 years to play at the level that he played at to win the world series five times like he did. uh, And just always be able to do the right, you know, say the right thing, do the right thing. Uh, You couldn't, you didn't find that in too many people, uh, especially in New York. And, um, you know, the one thing about Derek is, you know, it was perfect when he was asked the same question that you just asked that, what about the one voter that didn't vote for me? In a typical Derek Jeter fashion, he said, you guys want, that's your story. That's not my story. I want to, I want to talk to the 395 other people that did vote for me because that's, you know, that, that's who, I, that's what I focus on is the positive things. Uh, that's just how Derek was. And the one great story that I can tell you had nothing to do with on the field. It had to do with the 96 parade. Uh, we woke up late that morning and at about, we, we needed to hurry up because we both lived in the same neighborhood up on, uh, 64th and 2nd. He lived on 70th and 2nd. Uh, and we met each other with my wife and my son and we were running late and we said to the police officers, can you give us an escort? And they looked at us and said, dude, the streets are closed already. Everything's done. The only way you're going to get there is if you take the subway. Now, Derek had never taken the subway. I took the subway every day. And so I, I, he looked at me and he goes, what do you think? I go, dude, I take it all the time. Let's go. So we went down on the subway. And, of course, it was completely packed. But the good thing back in those days, not too many people, you know, there was no cell phones. So we didn't have to pose for a lot of pictures. But it was such a great experience. And Derek loved it because we rode down to the parade with the fans. And it was just like one big celebration. But, you know, he tells that story to a lot of people that that was his one time that he ever rode in the subway. And it was, it was to the parade in 1996. You played with Cody Bellinger's father, Clay, who is playing on the Dodgers right now, one of the best hitters in baseball. Do you ever remember seeing Cody around the clubhouse when he was younger and stuff like that? Oh yeah, my, my, my older son actually is the same age as Cody and uh, I believe Josh, uh, Josh Pettit too. And they, those three used to hang out all the time together and they'd be down in the clubhouse, you know, hitting off the, the batting tee and doing, you know, hanging out together. So uh, I do remember them being around each other in 99. Did you have any idea that he was going to be a great hitter? No, as a matter of fact, the first time I ever saw him after my playing days after 2000, you know, 2000 um, was the first day he was taking batting practice with the Dodgers. Uh, and I was down there for batting practice with uh, 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 um, Turner Ward, who was the hitting coach, and, 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 and who I played with when, in the minor leagues with the Yankees. And Dottie was down there, and uh, it was, it was, he had just got called up. And he was taking batting practice with them. It was the first time I had seen him. And uh, you could tell that he was, he was raw at that time. Uh, but he, you could tell he was going to be a pretty good ball player. Right, for sure. 
Now, you also played with Deion Sanders, who's one of the best athletes of all time playing baseball and football, but he also played with the Yankees when he played baseball. Do you remember what it was like playing with Deion Sanders and just how great of an athlete he was? Well, yeah, I remember Deion got, when he first signed with the Yankees, he, he came right to our team in double A. And, uh, you know, we didn't, you know, we knew him from his football days. We didn't know much about him playing baseball. And uh, his first at bat, or first game, he hit a ball off the wall. And, you know, we watched him hit the wall. And the next thing we know, we looked up and he was standing on third base. And we realized right then just how fast and how much of an athlete Deion Sanders was going to be. And uh, it was pretty neat to, to be able to be his teammate, to watch him develop into a baseball player, and then, of course, play with him in the, in the major leagues when he finally got called up. What was it like to play for Joe Torrey? Joe was, the, uh, was one, of the, one of the best managers I ever played for. He knew how to handle people. And, and egos and make sure that everybody was on the same page as far as what we were playing for, and that was to win. Um, he was one of the best at it, and, and I love the fact that uh, he didn't have an ego either. So when he hired his coaching staff, he hired some of the best quality people to put around him to, make him, to help him be successful. And Don Zimmer, Willie Randolph, Chris Chambliss, Mel Stoudemire, uh, Tony Cloninger, and Jose Cardinal. That group of guys, uh, Joe could not have picked a better uh, mix of, of people to really be able to handle all aspects of the game and all aspects of uh, certain situations that we would all face during the season, during the playoffs, because all of those guys had been through that before. It was just a really special special group of coaches that he had put together. Right. And baseball season is right around the corner with catchers and pitchers reporting today. Um, what do you think of the Yankees team this season? Um, what do you think are some of the expectations? Well, I mean, unfortunately for the players, uh, the expectations are no longer getting to the playoffs, but it's winning the World Series again. And it was kind of the expectations that the 90s teams had late in the 90s um, wasn't just get there. It's just you need to win this thing. So there's a lot of pressure on these guys uh, to, not, like I said, not only get there, but I do love the, uh, the moves that they made this offseason by picking up Garrett Cole and solidifying their pitching staff. And I do like the fact that, um, you know, the, the team that they have uh, – only improved from a 103 win season by getting Garrett Cole, and um, it's going to be. I think it's going to be a great, exciting year. I'm looking forward to being up there as much as I can, uh, you know, uh, in the suites and doing things for the Yankees uh, this year, and just and watch this because I think it's going to be a really, really exciting year for Yankee baseball. You were a catcher. What do you think of the Yankees catcher Gary Sanchez? Let's say he's a work in progress. I mean, you know, every year, um, you know, he had a very good season last year offensively. He started putting the defense together a little bit better. Um, but, you know, he was, he'll be the first one to tell you that there's a lot more room for improvement on the defensive side. Um, but, but I, like I said, I think, you know, the encouragement, if I am a coach for the Yankees, if I was a coach, would be that he's getting better every year, uh, and he realizes himself that there is still room for improvement, and he's going to continue to work on getting better, which I think is a positive sign for everybody. Now, the biggest story in baseball has been the Astros cheating scandal. Um, what are your thoughts on that, and do you think that they should vacate the World Series? No, I don't think that's I don't think that's a punishment that's you know uh, fair um, because you got to realize too that not only did maybe the hitters have an advantage, um, but the pitchers really didn't. 
and some of those pitchers pitched pretty good games against the Yankees um, and other teams. So I, I think that's kind of a, a, a tough way, a tough thing to do. I do think the punishments that they got were fair. I think they did take the, you know, the stealing forever in the game, but I do think that they took it to a level that was, uh, that would, that, that had to be, um, somehow because of the real time, uh, the real time that they were able to do it in was a part of the game that we cannot allow. Um, you know, as far as tipping pitches and stealing signs and all that other stuff, that is part of the game. But to be doing it with the technology that they had in real time is an unfair advantage that, um, that I think, like I said, that Rob Manfred and them came down with the right punishment. Do you think that this dark cloud will always be on the Houston Astros, or do you think that there will ever be some redemption for that team? It's really up to them and if in, in the type of season that they're going to have this year. There's going to be a lot of pressure on them uh, to be able to perform uh, to the standards that they had set for the last two or three years when they were using this system. So I think it's, just, it's, it's one of those things that we're going to have to just wait and see. Um, I think their teams, are, you know, their teams are very talented, um, but yet we'll, you know, we'll be able to have a little better idea of just how important that science dealing was uh, by the end of the, t- the 2020 season. Right, for sure. Now, recently I had Brett Boone on my podcast. And he told me that he thinks Aaron Judge could hit 340 with 70 home runs in a season if he stayed healthy. Do you think that could happen for Aaron Judge? Well, I don't know if I would go to the 340 level, but I could say that he could probably hit 300 and be right around the 50 to 60 mark pretty consistently because he has that kind of power and he's learning his play discipline is getting better and better every year. So I think there is that possibility. He's not just a, a swing home run guy. He does a very good job of, uh, of putting the ball in play and taking what he's given. So I, I do think that a 300 average and a possible 60, 50 to 60 home runs could be possible for him. Right. Now, last question for you before I let you go. When did you realize it was time to hang up your jersey and cleats and retire from baseball? Uh, when the judge in Florida gave me a decision that I either lose of the boys or that if I don't play baseball that I get custody of my boys, that's when it was time to leave. Yeah, I was just saying, in, in 2003, if you're going to four, I was offered a contract by the Padres to come back and play for a million dollars from Kevin Towers. And, uh, when I went to the judge in Florida, I had just gotten custody of the boys during my divorce. And the judge from Florida said, if I went back to playing baseball, then I would lose the custody. And so I made a decision to give up the game that day. Uh, and that's when I knew it was time to, to move on.